Hello and welcome everyone to the next episode of Build on Serverless. This is episode number three. This time we're going to be building the booking service. But first and foremost, we've let me welcome the featured guest, which I'm actually honored to have you here for the first time ever, Nader Dabit. Hello, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. That's awesome. Uh, everyone, if you're actually watching for the first time, this is a series of the second season of Build on Serverless. We are building a serverless airline as an example. That's going to be in two phases, the prototyping where we just actually scratch the surface on the best tools we can use to develop fast, as fast as possible. And we don't worry too much about implementing any best practices. On the second phase, we implement those best practices, integration, testing, monitoring, better deployment, and things like this. Nader today is going to be building the booking service. So let me switch the screen a little bit so I can see another screen and let's see if we we can see the first picture on how we're going to build today sure would you like me to go ahead and share my screen yeah go ahead and share your screen and let me just monitor the chat and make sure that i, I can actually see that too okay i i can see it here we go i can see it now for perfect Nader, do you want to go to what we're going to build today i think it would be quicker from your side Sure. So basically, we have a basic schema right now for creating a new flight. And we're going to basically add additional uh, fields to our schema to add another uh, functionality for processing a booking and creating a booking. So we'll first um, extend our base uh, flight schema and we'll add a new uh, booking type. And that's going to allow us to create a, a new resolver or a new uh, GraphQL operation that we're going to label process booking. That's going to do exactly that. It's going to process the flight booking. So uh, we essentially will create a new flight, have it available to our users. The user can then create a new booking on that flight. And the process booking uh, operation is going to be a pipeline resolver in AppSync. And what essentially that is, it's, uh, it's like a, a basic uh, regular resolver, except you're able to pipe the results into uh, a, another resolver or another function. And they're, they're labeled as functions in the AppSync uh, service, but they're essentially gonna allow us to do multiple operations within a, a single API call. So what we're gonna do first is we send the process booking operation to our AppSync API. We'll then uh, verify the payment. Um, once the payment's been verified, we'll then reserve the actual flight. And after the flight has been uh, reserved, which basically is gonna decrement a counter for the number of available seats for that flight, we're gonna then only process uh, the booking after the reserve flight operation has, has succeeded. Because we wanna make sure that we don't overbook this flight. So we're basically starting with the number of seats. As long as there is a seat available, uh, we'll then allow the function to continue to, to actually book the uh, flight reservation. If there is an, are no available seats left on the flight, we'll then call an error and then return uh, an error back to the uh, user um, with some information there. And then finally, if the create booking operation has succeeded, then uh, the pipeline will resolve and the function will finish. And th that will be it. Awesome. Yeah, just a, a comment on the pipeline resolver. Uh, for now, we're using pipeline resolver and we're not going to be able to create the integration with Stripe as of today because there's too much to build today yet. We only have about 55 minutes. What we're going to do, we're going to split that into two parts. Today, we build a pipeline resolver, we build the booking, we extend the schema that we created before, and we're going to do the reserve flight and, and the create booking, the reserve booking in that scenario. The second episode, we're going to start introducing API Gateway, Lambda, SAM, Stripe, and a bunch of other stuff. All right, that looks good to me. And there's also another part, uh, another, we we also need to fetch that booking from somewhere. Now that you're going to create the booking type, I think you have an image on that one to show, right? Yes. Um, are you talking about uh, the API call to AWS AppSync from Amplify? Yeah, you also have a list of bookings. There's another image. If you don't, that's fine. Uh, we can actually show that live. Yes, let's see here. I think I do have a copy of that. One second. All right, perfect. Let me just check. Uh, for you, Mark, who just missed the very beginning, don't worry, we, we, are, we have just begun. Though. So we're actually just kind of showing you a very quick recap of the images 
and what exactly we're going to build in this episode. But don't worry, you haven't missed much. We're going to build everything live now. All right, here, here we go, yeah. Uh, so the list bookings, uh, is this is the image for list bookings here, yeah. Yeah, perfect. So do you want to do a quick uh, quick intro to what that actually means, or what we're going to be building today? I'm just going to answer a few questions on the chat. Yeah, sure. So list bookings is going to basically allow you to uh, fetch all of the bookings that you have um, for for you as a user. And we're also going to be uh, using, um, you know, AppSync, of course, is our back end. And um, we're going to basically uh, be able to send a request, you know, based on uh, who the user, the currently uh, logged in user is using um, an auth decorator or an auth directive in the Amplify um, GraphQL transform library that will automatically set some authorization and fine grain access control rules so we can kind of only query for our own bookings and we're not able to access other people's bookings, which, you know, would make sense in a typical, in any typical application. Awesome. Okay. So I guess we, we just crack on and um, yeah, over to you, Donner. Where do we start? Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. So this is uh, what we're looking at here is just the app uh, currently running. Um, it's, it's deployed using the uh, Amplify console. So we have a live version of it here. And then we also have a local version uh, here. And what we what I did was um, I'll go ahead and open the main repo for this application. And I basically forked the app into um, my, you know my GitHub account. And this is the fork here. And I, I cloned it, but I actually created a new uh, version of that in in my um, GitHub repo. So I, I removed the git history, uh, checked out the proper branch, uh, and then re removed the git history and then created a new um, version. And then to deploy this to the Amplify console, you can actually just click this uh, orange deploy to Amplify console button. And this will deploy not only the back end, but also the entire front end. And you'll be able to uh, then have this uh, deployed to a live URL. And uh, if you go to AWS Amplify, and we'll make sure we're in the right region, then you'll see that you have the app deployed here. And this will allow you to do continuous integration, continuous deployment. And when you're ready to uh, add a custom domain, you can do that here in domain management. So that's kind of how I got started. Uh, that's how I got where I am now. Um, what I then did was clone the repo locally. And I have that here. And I ran npm install to install the dependencies. And um, so if you wanted to kind of follow along at any point, that's kind of what you would need to do. You would need to go ahead and uh, uh, click that deploy to Amplify console. That would be then cloned into your account. You get cloned locally and you run npm install. And then to actually serve locally, you can run npm run serve. And this needs to be done. Uh, actually, it's going to be view serve. And this needs to be done. Uh, so, so actually, another the npm run serve actually is a, is a shortcut for that. OK, so npm run serve will also work. And I, th I believe you need to do that from within the source directory. Yeah, that's right. You also need to do an amplify init in there. But I will be uh, after this episode, I'm going to be changing the readme uh, to point those steps out. Oh, right. OK, yeah, amplify init would be uh, what you would need to do to initialize the local version. OK, cool. So yeah, so that's where we are now. And what we want to do next is we want to take our schema that we have now, and we want to go ahead and add the new fields that we're working with. So the current schema, when you open your Amplify project, uh, the one that we just downloaded, you're going to have this Amplify folder here, of course. Um, and if you've worked with Amplify, you've seen this. If you haven't, this is kind of where all the configuration goes. We have a current cloud backend folder, which is what is currently deployed. And we have a backend folder, which is kind of our development folder that we're going to be able to make changes to and then push to uh, deploy those, those changes. In the API folder, we have a schema.graphql that's going to be inside of the API that we're working with. And this is our current base schema. with, uh, And it's kind of like an annotated schema. And this gets expanded. And if you want to look at the expanded version, uh, we have um, 
that you, you'll be able to see that as well in just a moment once we uh, push that up. But what we want to do now is take the base schema and add the new fields that we're working with. So right now we have a flight number. We also want to add a seat allocation um, because right now our basic flight doesn't really have a way to tell whether there are any, any seats uh, available yet uh, or available on the flight. So for instance, if we book 10 flights, how do we know if there are any seats left? We're going to now set a new seat allocation integer there. And this is going to be able, it's going to let us uh, create a flight with a set number of seats. And this way um, we can actually um, start uh, decrementing that seat allocation. Next, we want to create a, a new booking type. And I'll go ahead and start typing that here. In the meantime, let me answer one question. So for those of you who are asking about where the previous episodes are, uh, we just posted on the chat a YouTube playlist where we upload those videos afterwards. If for some reason you have to drop because you have something else to do, uh, don't worry. Uh, as soon as this, this, this particular video stream uh, stops, we have a temporary video that's actually on the twitch.tv slash AWS uh, page. There's going to be a video link on the top that you can simply go down there and see what just has been streamed, but it's now offline for, for grabbing it. Okay. Right. So what we're doing here is we're, we're taking uh, a base type of booking and we're adding the at model directive. This is going to deploy the DynamoDB table as well as the resolvers. And then we're adding another field uh, called auth. And this allows us to specify authorization and, and fine grain access control rules. And I'm going to go ahead and type out uh, what we're going to be working with. Nader, can you also do a, a zoom on your, on just one, one single zoom on your screen? I just want, yeah, perfect. Sure, sure. In the meantime, Nader is actually typing in. Uh, so that off is new for us. We didn't have that before because the flight, everyone should be able to list for a particular flight and that should work just as fine. But on the booking side of things, we actually want to be more strict. We want to be able to get everyone to list their own bookings or make modifications to their own bookings. But we also want uh, more details. For instance, let's say we have a broker where we have an agent that may be able to book on behalf of other users. So that group's admin that you see over there, they end up being cognito uh, user groups where you can just keep creating and adding into the array. And basically, as soon as any user authenticates that's part of that group, they will be able to inherit the ability to list, create, update, and things like this. But we still, what we actually do even more importantly, different from the default documentation that only gives you a allow owner, we have custom needs. So as you can see, we have the owner field and we also have the identity field. Once you log into Cognito using Amplify, the sub is the field that gives you a unique identifier. So we want to use that and inject into DynamoDB to make sure we don't pass along the customer email address or full name. We want to make sure we have only the ID and we match that every time they, they log in. And that's how we actually do the owner field and identity field. All right. And then we're actually also using uh, at connection, which is going to allow us to um, have a uh, relationship between the booking and the flight, flight type. Perfect. We have and this, that's actually that's, new, right? Um, we, we haven't used this before. Oh, we haven't. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So if you'd like to create uh, relationships manually, you know, in, in AppSync, you can do that. You can go in, uh, you know, create uh, custom resolvers and things like that to, you know, define your relationships. But we've actually provided decorators uh, or actually directives in, in, in the Amplify uh, GraphQL transform library. So we've looked at auth, we've looked at model. Connection is just another helper that allows us to define uh, relationships between uh, two different uh, types. So we're basically saying that we want a relationship between uh, the flight and the booking. And thanks for those of you actually pointing some of the typos out. We have a few typos, but we can fix that in a minute. So before you just do a push, there's a few typos we need to fix on that one. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Um, so for those of you who are asking more questions about the off itself, let me send you the documentation because we cover exactly this 
over there. Similar. So then I can show you uh, and actually give you more uh, details about that too. So let me grab the link real quick. So that should be amplify.aws and I should be able to see the documentation. Amplify GitHub docs. So there should be a off in here. Mm -hmm. I'm just grabbing the link in the meantime. So that should be under the transform and the transform there should be an off. So here's the direct link to the documentation that you can find out more information. Mm -hmm. So from there, you can actually add multiple groups. And so this actually, uh, once we show you the custom is over, you're going to be able to see how the magic goes behind the scenes. But essentially, this is just a wrapper to kind of make it easier for you without knowing how to write Apache Velocity and things like this. But because you have access to the whole token and what groups they belong to, you can do normal if and else conditions and you can say, not only I allow any user to, to retrieve their own, or you can do customized things like if the user is part of this custom attribute or if the user is equal to X, then you actually, you can go even more granular. Uh, there's also a few blog posts about it. I'm going to put that after the stream where you can see how you can even do multi authorization uh, based on friends, based on uh, comments, based on, on a number of occasions. Okay, great. So, um, so we're done with the schema. Um, we're going to go double check to make sure, you know, we got all the typos, but really the main thing that's happening here that we're going to be working with is this process booking mutation. And you see that we've uh, redefined uh, an input here. This create booking input is going to be available to us um, later on also in our expanded schema, but we also need to define it here because we need to uh, use it as the input for this process booking mutation. And then this is going to simply just return uh, a booking. So um, yeah, so the typos, did I catch all the typos here? I think I've seen- um, Yeah, there's one more. So there was groups, now it's groups, that's perfect. Uh, on on the fields, uh, so this the status uh, it's actually fine. The inbound flight that's not a required field. We don't we don't actually need that for now. Uh, inbound flight. Okay. Yeah, yeah I mean, we're actually flight. leaving that as a spoiler alert in case someone wants to fork the repo and implement a return flight by themselves. So okay. let's just leave it there for now. Cool. Yeah, that that looks pretty good to me. We have the ID. We have. The status, we have the enum, uh, which basically got the status of that booking. We have the process booking, which is going to be turned into a pipeline resolver. Yeah, we look good. Okay, we can cool. go ahead and, um, and, and try that. So now that we have that set up, we can go back to our, uh, our main project. We should be able to run amplify status and see that we have an update available to us in the API category. So we have API and then update since we've made changes to the backend folder. So now we can run amplify push. This is one of my favorite parts because it shows you that you have to update. So I can just go ahead and continue, but better than that. Oops, there's something there. Identity field is not defined. Oh, there's a typo is identity, not identify field. Uh, there we go. So that's good. The it, typo is called. At least he didn't cap, he didn't deploy and then he would fail. That's, true. that's something I love about uh, <laughs> that's something I love about uh, static linting on that one. Cool. All right, let's so, see if that works. So it checked it this time. It went it went through. Uh, now it's prompting us because now we can generate that GraphQL code gen locally. And since we have a new mutation, we probably want to do that. So we choose yes to go ahead and generate all of the statements locally. Perfect. Right, so this is going to go ahead and deploy, um, and this might take about a minute or so. So, yeah, which is actually one of the pieces that I found really interesting. If you scroll up a little bit on the outbound flight, that's something that grabbed my uh, actually on the booking type. There's an outbound flight uh, uh, field. That was exactly what grabbed my attention from GraphQL. From just for background, when I was trying to learn GraphQL with AppSync and everything else. I found GraphQL very powerful from a selection set, uh, avoid the overfetching, underfetching, and everything else it brings. But from the DynamoDB perspective, I personally always had trouble to do it the right way, uh, using multiple tables, actually grab data from multiple sources and things like this. But when I saw the connection, everything made so much sense on the power of GraphQL. 
you know, Gr Nader is going to be doing that, but in the meantime, it's being deployed. Let's just talk a little bit. On when you select a booking, let's say you want to list all those bookings uh, for that particular user. And you, when you select the field outbound flight, because you want their return from the client, uh, you actually will be able to select all the properties of, of that flight, because you see as a return as a flight type. And GraphQL or AppSync engine in that case, will actually make a query to the flight table and return to you only when the client actually needs that information. If I don't need it, it only queries the booking table. So that makes it so much uh, more powerful, uh, the query language and the whole NoSQL piece. All right, so we're updating on that one right now. And yeah, just uh, jumping back to the terminal, let's go ahead and, mm -hmm. and kind of keep an eye on it, make sure everything goes through. Uh, right. Properly. It if, looks fine there so far. One thing we're going to need, and it's actually just completing right now. If you want to jump to the Amplify uh, AppSync console, we want to make sure we have a flight ID to try to create a booking first. I think you, you kind of have tried that before. Yeah, you tried it already. Yeah. So um, before we started, I went ahead and created a new flight in our table. But the thing right now about this flight is since we're going to be decrementing, the, uh, the seat allocation. When we initially made this flight, we, I believe, did not have the seat allocation. Yeah, so you what I have could do, either create a new flight and uh, add the seat allocation, or I could modify this uh, item in our database to set the seat allocation. What do you think would be the best uh, way to approach that? Let's, let's try to create a new flight and add the new field so people can see it as well. I think it would be okay. good for them to see. It, 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 it gives, uh, to me, one of the most useful parts of AppSync on the console is to keep playing with the data on, on, on the query side of things. OK, so I might reduplicate that Madrid flight. And we'll go to queries. And this is where we'll go ahead and create that new, that new flight mutation. OK, so I'll walk through this. So we have a mutation uh, for, I might call this uh, create new flight. And here we're calling uh, the create flight mutation. And if you go to the query explorer on, or the documentation explorer on the right, you can see that we have the definition for, you know, for this query, uh, for this uh, mutation here. And if you look at the input, it kind of defines all of the fields that, uh, that we need. And once the new resolver, uh, the new updates have been deployed, we should now see that new seat allocation. So let me actually refresh. Yeah, I was going to say that. that <laughs> Caching sometimes is not our friend. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so we have create flight. Yeah, and there we, we go. we now see that we have the seat allocation. So what we're going to do now is we're going to add a new field for that seat allocation. And you see that we actually have an error because we're missing a, a required field. So seat allocation, we'll just set this to like 200. And this will uh, allow us to have 200 seats on the flight. We have our departure dates, our departure airport code, all of that stuff here. So once this is successful, we're only going to we're only going to be returning the ID. So we should only see the ID show up here. So let's you, go be, before you before you go ahead and do that, you need to add a new field, the seat allocation, right? Oh, oh you added yes. it there. Oh, I can see at the top. So yeah, yeah, we just added maybe, the seat allocation. What about we okay. try three? three instead of 200 so we can see when that can fail so you just remove the the zero zero so just make it three instead of three oh, just make it three seats okay yeah i know it's going to be a very very short flight <laughs> i just want to make sure uh it's we like can show <laughs> yeah exactly i just want to make sure that we can show how we can do more uh oh you need to log in again yeah, um, let me log back in because one one thing that i was learning when i was doing this is it re uh, it's really interesting how you can do update expressions and conditions on Dynamo. And that's the perfect fit when we start creating a custom resolver. Um, so I'm, I'm, you've probably already gone over this before, but since we're using an authenticated uh, AppSync API, we're working with uh, real user information in, in the resolvers. So we need to be authenticated to log in. And once you've add, added authentication to your AppSync API with uh, Cognito, they're gonna ask you for a web client ID. And if you go to your AWS exports file, you can actually just copy that here in the AWS user pools web client ID and log in with the same user that you've registered for in the actual uh, regular app. 
So I need to add that seed allocation back, it looks like. And, and you need a comma there. Or I don't think you need, a, or maybe you, need, you don't need a comma. Don't remember the syntax. Try I that. Think, I think they're optional. I think you can, you can if you like. <laughs> Amazing. Here we go. Now we have, a, we have a new flight in there, right? We're going to need that ID for when you create a new booking. Yes. We've created the flight. We have the ID. If we look at DynamoDB, the flight's there. Um, we'll see the new field uh, seat allocation. So we're good to go. So we can either copy this flight ID and use it later, or we can do a list where we have this query here that's just going to give us all the flights that we have available. And it gives us kind of an easy way to you know, get the ID for uh, when we're going to need it. So now that we've created the new mutation, we now need to uh, look at creating the resolver for that mutation. So let's take a look at our evolved schema. And let's go down to query. Oops. We now have the, um, which, which is the new resolver that we created? Let's see here. So actually everything is in place. We're going to be creating a new mutation called process booking. Mutation, mutation, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's going to be our pipeline. That should be process booking. I can't see them there. Maybe you just did you, when you, let's see. So if you just on the right hand side on the filter types, if you just type mutation, let's see if there's a process booking in there. Ah, oh, there we go. Here we go. So to your question, Dam, in the meantime, the reason oh, we did this was to show you yeah. I think the, the reason we did. <laughs> Sorry. I think the problem was this needs to be a mutation with the uppercase M. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Well, we, we can just actually push it again. In the meantime, it pushes. You can just go ahead and create a new booking, and then we can show the power of the connection uh, of using querying multiple tables at the same time. Just press yes one or two more times and we should be good to go. Then come on, we're going to be back to your question very shortly on why we actually created the mutation manually. But in short, we, we're going to be creating a pipeline resolver from there. All right, so let's go back to the queries. Uh, another, can we, in the meantime, it's being created, can we try to create a new booking manually? Sure. So uh, with the mutation here, like create booking. Yeah, exactly. Let's try to create a new booking now that we know uh, the flight ID. And just to kind of show how how you can create a new booking and how you're gonna list the data into multiple tables. So we're creating the, the, the new mutation. We can kind of give this a name that we'd like to have a reference for us. So I'll, this, I'll call this maybe new booking. And this will call the create booking. And then we have the input with a, um, all of the different fields here. So we're going to set a payment token, uh, some token. And here we need the uh, booking outbound flight ID. So this is going to be the ID that we got uh, earlier off of the um, booking. Oops, looks like I need to log in again. Uh, for your for your questions, uh, Pug Lugger, it's a cool username. Uh, <laughs> so basically those at something, these are called GraphQL directives. So that will essentially turn into an extended schema. So under Amplify folder, there's gonna be an Amplify and then uh, there's going to be a build folder uh, and that build folder, you see everything else that's being expanded and everything else that has to be turned into code, like query something, create a mutation, all of this that we haven't had to write any code whatsoever. That's part of the uh, the resolvers. So inside the Amplify, there's going to be a folder called uh, resolvers. And then you should be able to see lots of files with the name of the uh, mutations dot create booking dot request dot VTL. Um, but you can also see that from the AppSync console on the documentation explorer, you should be able to, to, to just look for mutation and that's going to be showing you a link. That's the resolver that queries a particular flight table or booking table there, which we're going to do next. It shows you the real code that those directives actually ended up creating it. 
So creating a booking into putting an item into DynamoDB or doing a scam or doing a, a single query. So that's all what the resolvers do. So yes, it's it's possible. Sorry, I had to get my um, environment ready to, to create this new mutation. I had a couple of errors there. So for create booking, uh, we need the uh, booking inbound, uh, I guess the booking outbound flight ID. Booking, out, booking outbound, yeah. And then the token. Yeah, for now we can pass anything because we're not gonna do any checks. Okay, I think it, I think the return is going to be as an outbound flight, but you don't need to do you don't need to do that. We can do a query after to show the power of it. So let's see if we can create a new booking. Yes, Whew, one, new less. Booking. <laughs> <laughs> one less, one less. So now what do we do? We want to do list the list bookings? Yeah, so we we can even do a query that booking if we want. That that's going to be shorter. So if you just do a get booking, and pass that ID, and then. I want to show to everyone on the stream why we did those connections because that's where the power comes from. You can even open up the doc if you like. Uh, so essentially, there's going to be a there should be an outbound flight in there. Here we go. And that to me is awesome because you can see it's being automatically it's being auto completed every proper property of that particular flight. When this is what we call selection set in GraphQL. So that's exactly what you want as part of the return. So we are doing a get booking, but as soon as GraphQL sees there's an outbound flight field, we're gonna call another resolver that's gonna f that's gonna query the flight table to get the, the flight that we want. When you are constructing the booking view in Vue.js, that's awesome because you only you only get exactly what you need. And you don't have to do any other code to get all that, that pieces done. And that also works with batch gets or batch writes. Uh, we can go even more complex than that. So that, What's... that yeah, I think that's that's fine. I was going to say something else, but. Oh, yeah. no, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just double checking to make sure that we had the update uh, fixed now. Oh yeah, let's, let's go. I think you need to refresh it just in case if you go back to schema and refresh it. We should be able to see the mutation there. I think it's called process booking, right? Yes, there it is. And so if we go to resolver now, we should see that in our resolver. Awesome. There we go. And you'll notice that we have uh, already resolvers for all of our other res uh, all of all of our other operations, all of our other mutations, because the GraphQL transform library will automatically you know build those resolvers for us. The only reason we don't have a resolver yet for this mutation is because it's a custom resolver and we're creating it ourselves. So the next step would be to go ahead and click attach to create a uh, new resolver. And this is gonna be a pipeline resolver. And what we're gonna be doing is creating uh, functions here. And then whenever we're ready to start using those functions, those are gonna be the pipeline. So we start attaching those here. So let's go ahead and create do you think we should go ahead and create the functions first or create the pipeline first? You know what, let's create a pipeline first and then people will start seeing the pipeline being built one by one. Um, I think to me, when I did it for the first time, that was actually an eye opener. Okay, so we click on schema, we go to our resolvers, we click attach, and then here's a button here or a link to convert to pipeline resolver. We're gonna click that. And we're gonna have a couple of things here. We have the before mapping template, the after mapping, template and then the then the pipeline functions or the pipeline uh, resolvers that kind of go in between the before mapping template and then after mapping template. Uh, so the before mapping template allows us to take the data that's kind of coming in uh, into the resolver and, and, and do stuff with it. We can we can shape the data or we can uh, store it in the stash is, is what we're going to be doing where we basically kind of like store it and have have it available to us later. Um, and then the after mapping template just tells how to take the data and return it to the, uh, the operation, uh, the mutation or the query. So for the, for the before mapping template, I'll go ahead and open that up and I'm gonna go ahead and copy and paste uh, what we need here. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be storing the outbound flight ID, the payment token and the customer uh, unique identifier, which is the sub. 
And this is going to be available to us later because we're going to need to be able to retrieve it from the stash. So we'll be able to basically say, um, hey, we want to get this, this variable or that variable from the stash and it'll be available throughout all of these other functions. And we're getting something interesting is uh, the context. So you might be used to working with the context. We're working with the identity here. This has all of the, the different identity information about the currently uh, logged in user that's making the request. So you'll have things like their user ID, their sub, which is their unique identifier, as well as other metadata. So right. go ahead and create the first function. OK, so we click that to go ahead and create the, the, first, uh, the first function, which is going to be the verify payment uh, resolver. So this is going to be working off of the uh, data source. Or actually, is this going to be a, uh, let me double check. Oh, yeah, this is going to be a new data source, isn't it? Yeah, we, we need to. So the first thing we can do is uh, we get a payment token uh, that we pass from the clients. So ideally, the front end, we just do a call to Stripe in the next episode, get that token back from Stripe and say, hey, I captured a payment and pass that to GraphQL and we should be able to verify that. So for now, we're just going to mock it to make our development faster. So we're just going to create a new data source and we're going to use a service called a HTTP bin which uh, is actually quite powerful when you're just trying to do this kind of a mocks. So we can call this a payment, uh, payment API because in the next episode, we're going to be using the real uh, Amazon API gateway and Lambda to do the, the heavy lifting. So let's just do this. And now we can start creating our function to make a call there and just start doing that pieces. So we'll go back again here because we needed to create that data source. Um, so let's so I think go you, back you, I think you may need to, to refresh that. To your question, uh, Puglogger, uh, that's exactly what we're going to do in the next episode. For now, we're going to show you uh, two, more, two more advanced features. You can actually use the pipeline resolvers to call any HTTP endpoint and not only a DynamoDB table or any other AWS services. And then we will also be able to create a Lambda function that we can call directly. The, the reason for this pipeline resolver is we can make multiple calls sequentially instead of having to, the client to keep making multiple calls. And so think of, think of it as a chained, uh, chained functions, chained processing activities with the nice benefits of the stash that you saw up there is a way for us to say, because these functions are completely independent from one another and it's perfect for reuse across multiple uh, processing uh, capabilities. The data that you receive from the client is only going to be available from the first function. So ideally, you want to have a place like a, mem a shared memory somewhere where you should be able to access those, retrieve those values. That's where stash comes in. Uh, so, so this context.stash is actually able to do that for us. And by the way, don't, don't be afraid of actually looking at the qu and the syntax and not understanding at first. Uh, we're going to be creating a pull request and, and adding more context to you. But all of those are actually auto-completed. Okay, so we've created our first uh, pipeline function. I think I need to go ahead and create them here because we, uh, we if we save uh, the mutation, um, it's going to bring us back anyway. So okay. I'm going to go ahead and uh, just create the three functions here. So the, this okay. one basically is just going to go to the endpoint that we specified as the HTTP endpoint. When we set the data source, it's going to automatically have that URL. And it's going to go to status slash 200. This will always return. 200 is that right uh yeah Hightower? that's right mm -hmm. yeah so this is just kind of mock you know to kind of like show us we're actually we really are hitting an endpoint but it's always going to return uh, true it's always going to return valid and then we uh just return the result and uh that's it the pipeline finishes and then we're going to add a new function and this is going to be um basically our reserve uh flight function yeah, and that's going to be looking into the flight table, right? The data source. Yes. And this is going to be what decrements the uh, the uh, seat allocation. So I'm going to go ahead and copy and paste uh, that, and we'll walk through that real quick. So what we're going to be doing is updating the existing flight. So we have the flight. We have the seat allocation set to three. What we want to do is decrement that by, that by one, because before we actually uh, you know, can continue to, to actually verify this. We want to make sure that it's there. And if it is there, we want to go ahead and decrement it. So the next person requesting it uh, has the proper number available. Available. So what we're doing is we're doing an update expression on Dynamo. 
and we're setting the condition to make sure that there are seats available. If there are, then we decrement by one. If there, uh, if it is not, this will return uh, an error. Yeah, exactly. On that expression key there, all you need to do is should build an expression that returns true. If it returns false, in that case, seat allocation is going to be zero. It's not going to be higher than zero. And in that case, fails. The nice benefit of this is that we actually fail and go back to the client and say, there's no seats, there's no seats left. So at least we can uh, do a basic, basic kind of atomic uh, counter and at the same time, making sure there's no race conditions at front. Obviously, so there's the more advanced ways what, of doing it. Uh, needs to pass. So that as long as this is true, then this, this will, will not fail. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Cool. And then the, uh, the request mapping template is nothing really uh, at all. I think it's, whoops, I think it's the same uh, request mapping template as before. The only thing that we're doing is we're going to actually return a custom error message that tells uh, the user that there are, or, or the person interacting with the API that there are no seats left. So we'll go ahead and save that function. And then we have our, our last function, which is the actual process uh, booking function. Or the reserve, uh, I guess. We'll That's going to be a reserve point. booking. Yeah, exactly. And by the way, don't, don't worry if this looks so looks a little bit fast at first, if you've never done this before. We're going to go uh, over each of those functions and explain to you again some of those uh, details. Uh, for yeah, now, we'll, we just want to we'll, make sure we'll we, we finish on time. Make sure it's working <laughs> and then we'll kind of walk through it. Yeah. Exactly. We also want to make sure that we have uh, everything done on by the end of this. We're kind of getting close on time already. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, this is going to be what actually interacts with the booking table to uh, create a new booking. And this is what we're going to be uh, looking at uh, as far as the uh, request mapping template. So this, all, all of these uh, six lines of code here are doing is they're taking the existing input. So if you remember when we created a booking earlier, we passed in an input with uh, two fields. We only had, uh, I think, the ID of the flight and the payment token. We're taking those that uh, those two fields and we're appending additional fields to that uh, to that map. So we're adding a created at. Uh, this is auto generated. We're creating an updated at. This is also auto generated. We're creating a type name and a checked in. So we're automatically assuming that since this booking was just created, they haven't been checked in. So we're just setting that to false. And then we're now reading off of the customer uh, identity of the logged in user. And we're setting their customer value as sub. And then we're setting their status as unconfirmed. And that all, so all of this code here is just updating that input object or that input map. This is the actual operation that's going to be interacting with our DynamoDB table. So we're doing a put item and we're setting the ID. And this is going to be checking to see if we've passed in an ID. If we have, it uses that ID off of the input. If not, it auto generates an ID using auto ID. And then we have our attribute values, which is just this input map that we're going to be, you know, using as the attribute values. And then we're just making sure that this this ID does not already exist. So that's kind of what's going on there. And then awesome. let's go for the response mapping templates. In the meantime, answering your question, Dan, um, so I just kind of paste you the link. Uh, every AWS service has a page where they they explain what the limitations are. Some of those are soft limits, others are hard limits. So for the number of pipelines you can have is 10. And it's also one of the good pieces about having that limit is you also don't want to go crazy and keep adding multiple functions into a pipeline. So it's great that we're doing this, but it also has some downsides to it, which we're going to address in the next episode. So I give you one of the examples. We're doing this pipeline with over and it, it does in, sequ in sequence, right? But if a particular function fails, for instance, it stops right there and you will try to go to the response mapping and you would have to handle that code yourself. For instance, if you're trying to make a call to API Gateway as an outbound uh, for that payment token and that, and that API Gateway say, hey, too many requests, I'm going to throw it to you. And when that happens, you need to be able to handle, maybe you want to do a back off and try again, or you maybe want to have something more uh, sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So that's where pipeline resolvers can't really help you with that. So that's where step functions and other pieces come into hand, or just actually using a Lambda function for some of, some of that pieces. 
So now when we're creating the actual pipeline resolver using the functions that we just defined earlier, we're now able to select functions from this drop-down menu and they'll be executed in the order in which they are placed into the uh, actual pipeline. So if we wanted to take, uh, take one, we could choose it and move it up or down. Um, we first want uh, verify token to be executed. So we have that first, then we have reserve flight and then finally reserve booking. So we're basically verifying the token, decrementing the flight table, and then uh, processing the booking. And then after that, we're gonna return the result back to the uh, mutation caller. So we can uh, be interacting with the return values in our GraphQL. So we save that. And now we have our, uh, our mutation ready to go. I think, should we go ahead and test it out? Yeah, absolutely. So let's go back to queries and just try using the new process booking mutation, which was empty by then. And ideally that should work twice or three times, and then it should fail uh, afterwards, right? So That's the right. input is gonna be the same. So, oops, uh, what, we won't be able to get the payment token, just pass anything for now, it's dummy. And then we should be able to use the booking outbound flight ID. But that should be real, so we need that. I'll just copy the ID for the flight that we have available in our, in our table here. Right. Okay. okay. And we can even just return the ID. We don't need much for now. So let's okay. see if that works. We should be able to have a new booking that's unconfirmed. And I'll explain to you why the booking has to be unconfirmed. So let's see what we have there. So if you scroll oh, I think down, I know the error. It's actually, it's actually not even on that field. It's here because uh, seat allocation, when we first created this, it wasn't there. So let's try that again. There we go. Okay. So, so we, we got a new booking, right? So just yeah, to show you. Let's, I guess let's take a look at the, uh, the, the booking or the flight table again. So I sh it should decrement, right? So you have to do a refresh. It's not, it's eventual consistent as well. Right, right. So now we see the seat allocation is two. Yeah. So, so do you want to try a couple more times and see if we can break the bank? Let's process another booking. So we have one booking left now, or one flight, one seat left. We process one more. There's zero seats left. So now we process uh, for an empty. There's no seats left. So now yes. we get the message from the seats <laughs> left. Awesome. And by the way, that no seats left is the one that we actually made sure to return to the user. But one of the nice pieces is that when you return the first one, you can see the message in there, but you can get more information into CloudWatch logs. So you, you only, you don't, don't want to return everything back to the customer. So you can customize that too. Yep, so we can awesome. provide a custom message. So um, let's walk through kind of everything that we did uh, again, just to kind of like I guess, uh, drill it in uh, one more time. So, mm -hmm. you know, we took our existing uh, schema on our on the client and we appended the new, uh, or we kind of like evolved our schema and added a new seat allocation. And then we created the booking type. And we looked earlier uh, around um, how we have a unique identifier called customer. So if we look at the, um, we look at the booking table, you notice that we have a customer value uh, right here. And this is coming off of the uh, context identity sub. We looked at that earlier, but all of that, all of that uh, resolver logic was, was kind of like taken care of for us by setting, uh, setting this field. Um, so we created the booking type, then we created our custom resolver for processing a booking, but we didn't actually define the request or response mapping template here um, because we could do that, but we wouldn't be able to do a pipeline resolver using Amplify just yet. So we ended up having to actually go into the AppSync console and, and create our pipeline. So uh, after that, we uh, we did the Amplify push. We then had the uh, mutation up, uh, updated in our mutations. So we saw that we had this new process booking mutation, but there wasn't a resolver created yet. So we then created the resolver by going to functions and we added our three pipeline functions and then kind of like set those functions in the actual resolver. Exactly. Uh, just to kind of a for the curious mind on, if you go to the booking table real quick, 
you should be able to see to open up one of the items in there. So you see that the check-in was actually false. Remember that the very top uh, request uh, template that we used, the created at and uh, updated at, all of this actually had been introduced as part of the graph, the pipeline, uh, the customer you mentioned already, and the status being unconfirmed. The reason we are doing unconfirmed is in real terms, ideally you should be able to have a part of your, of your booking app where you have ability to give to the customer please let me select my seat, or I actually have a group of people, which make kind of a complicated things, but the idea is that you should be able to have a unconfirmed and return an ID, an ID back to the customer asynchronously. And then all of this other tasks that you need to do, you need to verify, for instance, if the payment is indeed what they, the, the flight they paid for, there was no fraud in it, or maybe there was a flight with the bad inputs, or I don't know, something ha could have happened, or you may want to check on fraud. Maybe a lot of people are buying the same flight and you may want to resell afterwards, which could be for could be good for an agency, but it couldn't be it wouldn't be normal for a single person, a single individual. Or maybe you want to do more checks. Uh, maybe you want to talk to the warehouse or talk to BI reporting. All of these pieces could be done asynchronously. So and that's it exactly sounds like what we're gonna do actually went the next episode for a second. We So let me just check. Yeah, sorry everyone, if you just noticed, we just dropped a little bit. Uh, we're back now, it was just like um, so a small Wi-Fi issue-ish. So we should be back now. So I was just kind of explaining real quick on how, why we had the, un the booking as unconfirmed is the next episode, we're gonna extend the pipeline and even simplify the pipeline by using Lambda and API Gateway and SAM CLI and service application repo. We're gonna start going even more complex than that, but ideally the next episode, we're gonna refactor some of those pieces and kind of show you the thought process and why we're doing what we're doing. So if you have any questions, now is the time. We have about five minutes left that we can answer questions, anything you like. It's not every day that you have another here doing streaming as well. So take advantage of that. <laughs> I actually, I do have a question for you another though. So, uh, the way we did all of, all of this was actually doing the back end side of things, right? Uh, from the front end, we just actually import and we do pretty much what we do, right? We just import the generated query and, and things like this. How is that in the React world? Because I know the Vue.js part really well, but I don't know React and React Native. Do people make changes to those the automated queries? How do they handle these things today? How, do they, how are they using AppSync in the whole GraphQL movement? Yeah, I mean, we would uh, we would work in a similar fashion to what you do in Vue. You would you would have this new so like we would have a couple of new operations that were created, you know, with all of these changes that we made. But I think the one operation that we would use, of course, is process booking. So the Amplify CLI um, should go ahead and create um, a you know a local version of of the um, mutation, and we would just import that, and we should be able to just to just use that. I know that um, a lot of people are interested in things like client side caching and offline, you know, uh, uh, functionality with, with GraphQL these days. So we're working on doing some um, improvements around the Amplify client framework for Vue, React, React Native for caching and offline. But for right now, we also have the AWS AppSync JavaScript SDK. So if you're interested in, um, you know, additional features that Amplify client doesn't have for uh, GraphQL in particular, you can actually use the AWS AppSync JavaScript SDK. It works with Vue, it works with React, and you get the offline functionality as well as the client side caching. Mm -hmm. so, that, so that means React, Vue.js, and pretty much all the front-end developers and the, whatever framework they use, they're following kind of the same process and workflow. It doesn't change much. They're just using the generated, um, queries and mutations and all that nice little features. And they're just customizing other bits and behaviors, right? So they're too, it seems pretty much unified. Yeah, I think it's very similar across all the different JavaScript frameworks at this point. Yeah. Uh, so back to one of the questions is, uh, how do I script this pipeline resolver that we've done through the console? Is that possible to automate? I think you know some of that, right? So right now it's not possible with the Amplify, uh, um, Amplify CLI. 
Um, but anything that you can, or, or the Amplify framework in general, it's something we're actually working on. And that's 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 a good point to kind of like point out that that we, at the end of the day, we want Amplify to be able to handle all of this functionality without having to go into the AppSync console to make changes at all. But uh, right now, if you do want to script that locally, I think you can do that using, uh, can you, you can do that, you do that using the serverless framework, I believe. Um, which is kind of a complete different, you know, approach than what we took today. Um, can you can you do pipeline resolvers with Sam? I, I would assume you could, considering it's cloud formation. But uh, I'm not absolutely, not and that's exactly what I was just posting on the chat right now. Uh, I um, that's exactly what we're gonna try to do next. So I have two choices now. We're gonna make a PR and probably give you the instructions on how you can do the pipeline resolver, or if you allow us a two or three days, I'm. More than happy to try to automate that. We can even use the custom stacks uh, inside Amplify CLI as a escape hatch for doing this until Amplify CLI uh, supports that. I also posted the RFC on the chat. So if you like the direction that we're, we're thinking that would be nice as a developer experience, please vote on that one. We'll definitely love your feedback if you also think we should be doing something differently. Um, I also posted a CloudFormation one. So if service framework supports, there has to be a CloudFormation in there, unless you use a custom resource. But yes, there's something called AppSync function configuration. And also the resolver has been extended to have a type as a pipeline. So yes, it is possible to automate. So we could possibly do this as a part of the PR, but yeah, it is possible to do it. Cool, and I would I would also mention that um, if you're interested in keeping up with the advancements and all of the different things that are coming out, we have we have very uh, rapid team. Like we have a lot of um, uh, improvements and releases on the AppSync team, and they all come out on the AWS mobile blog. And then also uh, me and a couple of the other developer advocates on the mobile team uh, talk about it and, and, and tweet about it. So if you want to keep up with the um, developments and the Amplify CLI and the Amplify Framework and AppSync, then I would um, I would check out the AWS mobile blog. I would follow Amplify on Twitter and maybe follow me or one of the other developer advocates on Twitter. And then Hightower does quite a bit as well. Um, make, make sure to follow him as well. Awesome. I also posted on the chat, we also have a Slack channel. Well, all the serverless gurus, uh, AWS staff, and a lot of people is also there. Uh, so feel free to join us. Uh, Amplify also has a Gitter if I'm not mistaken, yes, we have yes, a Gitter channel. Yeah. So you can always go ahead and ask questions and, and leave feedback. Uh, Amplify is completely developed on the open. So that's why you see those RFCs and all those discussions. So I think that's a wrap. I think that's pretty much it. Another, any last words you want to share on the experience of building this or even building the pipeline resolver for this? Um, it was a really uh, cool experience to kind of work with a project that I didn't create to kind of see how other people like uh, think about things and I actually learned a lot. So I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. And um, for people also that are interested in this stuff, uh, we launched a new website called Amplify Community and we feature different uh, people within the community and, and the content that they're creating around it. We also have workshops, slide decks, and uh, we have content that allows people to kind of put on their own uh, talks and screencasts. So if you're interested in that, check out Amplify Community. It's a pretty cool resource. Awesome. I just added that on the chat as well. So if you can see, it's amplify.aws slash community. Uh, Nader, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, it's a huge pleasure. And wow, that's all I can say, man. Thank you so much again. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure. <laughs> no problem. Everyone, thank you, for, thank you so much for watching this, the third episode of Build on Serverless. Next episode is next Wednesday. Now we're going to start introducing Sam, Sam CLI, and it's going to be our serverless hero from Serbia, Alexander. So Alex is going to be coding most of it, actually. Let's see if he's up to the task. If he's not, happy to do the coding. But Alex is brilliant. He's done so many apps, so many contributions to the serverless community. I know it's going to be an awesome episode. If you're interested in, in Lambda, or Sam, Sam CLI, serverless application repo, and Amazon API Gateway, uh, that's now we're going we're to be shifting the focus to more of the custom complexity and some custom code that GraphQL, in that sense, cannot help us on that one. And everybody else, thank you so much again, and I hope to see you in the next episode. Have a nice one. Thank you. <laughs>